Okay, hope you have energy. Uh, first of all, let me thank you, uh, the organizers, for inviting me. As I understand, I'm the only experimentalist in the team. And also, as the last speaker of a long day, and as an experimentalist, it's my duty to show you some pretty pictures. And I will do that. So here I am to give an overview of some uh, experiments made, uh, some experiments done with what we can call synthetic quantum systems. These are uh, cold atomic systems. And in the last five, 10 years, the community of um, experimentalists who are using all sorts of atomic physics techniques to solve problems in many body physics and at the same time use different tools borrowed from quantum information sciences, that community is growing. So uh, I'll try to give a very brief, very broad overview of uh, a couple of different experiments. On Wednesday morning, I also have uh, the very first talk I'm giving. So the way I structured these two lectures are as follows. Today, I will give you an overview of uh, the capability of these kind of experiments. So what can be done, what kind of simulations has been done, and uh, what kind of many-body physics we can look into. Uh, and in many-body physics, as we all know, the main thing is entanglement. And that's what we are trying to uh, understand, we are trying to solve. So Wednesday morning, I will be talking about how to analyze or characterize entanglement in those many-body systems. And I'll be talking about different kinds of methods uh, and also showing how entanglement entropy can be measured in an experiment on Wednesday morning. So, okay. Now, uh, in, in, in many body physics community, of course, we have some long-standing goals that then things like high temperature superconductor or some high energy physics strongly correlated systems, we want to understand the, a simple microscopic de description that can explain these things, okay? Uh, that is something like I would say the long-term goal of or the questions that uh, motivate us. But really in the lab, what we are doing is essentially solving the reverse problem, which is we have a bunch of uh, quantum objects Let's say those objects could be atoms that are cooled very close to absolute zero temperature, so they are quantum. Or we have a bunch of spins, spin half, and we have uh, learned about some spin half physics today. So in the lab, the goal is to find out how much control we can exert on these systems. And or let's put together a thousand of those atoms or you know, a hundred of those spins where we can control the interaction between the atoms or interaction between the spins and we are trying to understand, okay, what kind of interesting quantum phase of matter we can produce out of this system, and can we observe this experimentally in the lab? So that's essentially uh, the broad motivation for this field. Now, of course, uh, our challenge is if we want to simulate this kind of matter on a computer, uh, and as we all know, this becomes problematic because of entanglement, our Hilbert space, space grows exponentially. So for example, with through level systems, the Hilbert space grows two to the power n, uh, where n is the number of particles we have. So by the time we reach 40, just two to the 40, that number is one terabit. So it's a huge number. Uh, now, it's not true that we always need to um, fully diagonalize every Hamiltonian to learn about a quantum many body system, because in most cases, the, maybe the full uh, Hamiltonian is not, imp the full Hilbert space is not important. However, if we want to solve an arbitrary problem where we cannot just throw away uh, parts of entanglement, entanglement between parts of the system or make a simple approximation, then it would be good to have the capability to handle all this information. And that is prob problematic with computers because we just don't have that amount of memory or computing power in modern uh, computing systems. So. The idea here is whether we can use an experimental system to simulate this, to simulate uh, these problems. And as I said, in the last five or 10 years, the three branches of science, they kind of came together. And we have uh, 
heard about quantum many body physics and the intersection of that with quantum information sciences. So use the concepts of entanglement to characterize phases of matter. And where we come in additionally uh, is bring with uh, bring our tools used in atomic physics, all the spectroscopic tools and laser cooling, uh, all different tools that have been developed in many decades into this equation. And in this overlap region, essentially we use cold atomic systems to simulate non-trivial models of quantum matter and then characterize and then possibly make use of the resulting quantum many body states using tools from quantum information science, such as entanglement. So that's broadly speaking where we are uh, in terms of our research code. Now going back in time, in around 1982, Feynman wrote this paper where he asked a simple question or simple sounding question is can physics be simulated by universal computer? And the way he was asking is uh, he wants to simulate all of physics, including quantum mechanics, uh, including quantum elements. And his uh, like a simple solution was let the computer itself be built of quantum mechanical elements which obey quantum mechanical laws um, because then the quantum mechanical elements are trying to simulate a quantum mechanical world. They should not have the problem. They should know what Schrodinger's equation mean or how to evolve a wave function. Now it was not until uh, 1996 and this paper, Universal Quantum Simulators, that uh, Seth Lloyd is a landmark paper. And this is the abstract, just one line, which says Feynman's 1982 conjecture that quantum computers can be programmed to simulate any local quantum system is shown to be correct. So he says that no, this is not just a simple conjecture, but we can indeed um, do that provided we have access to um, interact with My animations are gone anyway. Um, so, so the Mm, right. So the idea here that Seth Lloyd proposed in his paper is that if we have access to uh, Hamiltonians, H1, H2, HL, these are local Hamiltonians acting on parts of the system, and we turn on and off these Hamiltonians very fast, right? So these T is the time, and N is we have split the duration of the time into N segments, and we, have, we are switching on H1 first and then H2 and so on and so forth up to HL, and then we repeat this cycle. So this is a digital sequence, turn on and off. This can be approximated by the Hamiltonian that we want to simulate, H system. Because the error terms from your uh, you know, Magnus expansion, you can see there would be error terms that will be proportional to the commutators of the Hamiltonians. By making N, that is the time step, the digitization step, larger, the n larger, so the digitization much better and finer, we can make this into almost an exact equality and make the error term small. So the point is if we want to simulate a Hamiltonian, uh, some quantum Hamiltonian by a quantum system, what we do is we uh, create a bunch of local Hamiltonians involving in one particle fields and two particle interactions and so on and so forth, and then switch on and off, on and off very fast. So this is the basic idea of what is known as uh, digital quantum simulator, universal digital quantum simulator, which can also perform as a quantum computer. Okay. Now, as a, uh, my favorite example is this paper from Reiner Blatt's group in 2011, where they took a bunch of spins, spin half objects in trapped ion system that I'll be um, talking about soon. And the Hamiltonian that they simulated is this enormous six spin Hamil Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian has you know, sigma 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, then sigmas are the Pauli matrices. So this is a very non-local interaction and something that you don't normally see if you have a quantum system, a six spin interaction, and only six spin. There are no two components, no three components. And the way they did that, uh, by building this digital uh, sequence, timing sequence, so essentially imagine these six are your six qubits, so zero and one, the qubit states. And on top of that, you apply 4D, okay, so there, sorry for all this uh, notation here. 4D is basically uh, a two spin Ising kind of Hamiltonian. And I'll be going into detail of how we can simulate Ising Hamiltonian in this system. And then a single qubit rotation on the first qubit, and then followed by again an Ising kind of interaction, two body interaction, and then you switch back and forth. Two body interaction, single qubit, two body, single, two body. And when you do that, 
effectively you see the inter Hamiltonian that they get is a six body Hamiltonian. So this is and forget about the details here, but essentially these two curves that you are seeing, the blue and the uh, yellow, those are the six pin, the probability of all six pins down, going from zero all the way up to you know, close to one and then coming back. So it's a six pin Hamiltonian created in a digital quantum simulator way. However, there are challenges. And one challenge is that because the Hamiltonian is obtained as an average of many uh, well-timed sequence, anytime you have a little bit of error in one of those small operations, so imagine there is an uh, unknown phase here which came from experimentalists' inability to precisely control the system, then you have errors accumulating. And so soon, when this n is, let's say, you know, 80 times you have repeated, the error is so big that now the Hamiltonian is not that Hamiltonian at all. So we, have, we are prone to that kind of uh, error. So this digital quantum simulation would work uh, reliably for complex simulations when these uh, small unitary evolution operators are almost perfect. And in principle, we can have you know, some kind of quantum error correction on top of that, but that also requires the operations to be nearly perfect, right? So this is a problem. Another alternate is to use a uh, um, analog quantum simulator. So what is an analog quantum simulator? The analog quantum simulator is basically, uh, if you can, go find a quantum system that has a Hamiltonian, which is exactly the same Hamiltonian you are trying to study. Right? So that's the simplest. So in that sense, the system is just emulating itself. Sometimes it's also known as emulator. And, uh, and I'll give you some examples. So here I have made a uh, definitely a non, not rigorous plot. This is just a conceptual plot here, where in the x-axis I am showing uh, basically the complexity of quantum simulation. And the y-axis is system size. So we have analog simulators and then the digital simulator. So digital simulators are complex because you have to make sure that all the uh, timing sequences are done properly. And then you have a range of analog simulators. And even within the analog simulators, there are different kind of systems. So for example, if I am trying to simulate how uh, different bosons interact with each other when they are very cold, or how fermions interact with each other when they are cold, then probably it will be the best idea to find a bunch of bosons and just make them cold. And they have the natural interaction that we are trying to simulate. They have the statistics. So those are the uh, systems that I am calling, rely, they rely on natural interactions. Some neutral atom systems that have been used to uh, study interacting bosonic systems etc. fall in that category. On the other hand, we also have examples of engineered interactions, meaning where the Hamiltonian that we are trying to simulate is not the native Hamiltonian. And I will give you an example later. So let's say I bring in uh, two trapped ions. Now these are spin half objects. But the direct interaction between these two spins are tiny. They are, let's say, Hertz level. They are really, really small. But I can engineer interaction between those two Hamiltonians. And because they are engineered interaction, I also have a lot of control over them. So I can switch off the interaction, for example, uh, which is very hard to do with um, you know, atoms that have natural interaction that we are trying to study. And then a little more complex is uh, I want to do analog simulator, but if I want a lot of control at the level of individual particles. So let's say I want to simulate a bosonic model of atoms, uh, bosonic atoms, but then I also want to control the phase of individual atoms, atom number one and five and seven. So experimentally, that's much more challenging. And finally, if I want to do a fully universal quant digital quantum simulation, then it's even more challenging. And the y-axis is you know, system size. So essentially, um, essentially, what that is is the more complicated or the more demanding the quantum controls are, the smaller the system size we can control. Okay, not a surprise, right? So to give you an idea, uh, analog or digital simulator where we have control over individual atoms, individual ions, uh, right now that number is about 5 to 10. So there is a quantum computer, fully programmable quantum computer, both from IBM using superconducting 
um, system, superconducting circuits, and also from Maryland using trapped iron systems where they have made a, a five qubit quantum computer recently. And there are some more progress with slightly larger number. On the other hand, if you want to study just a bunch of bosons, cold in um, very low temperature, then you can put thousands of them. Right? So there's a trade-off between them. So there are uh, different systems for uh, quantum simulation. Trapped ions, and I'm going to talk more about trapped ions here. Uh, there are neutral atom systems in uh, optical lattices. And also there are some non-AMO platform, non-atomic platform systems. For example, superconducting circuits uh, with photons, photonic networks, uh, even defect centers in diamonds, um, they can all be used for doing quantum information processing. Okay. So, among the systems that have the natural interaction, one very prominent system is uh, ultra cold neutral atoms in an optical lattice, optical potential. So, essentially, what you do, you take uh, a gas of rubidium or cesium or potassium or you know, some of your favorite atom. And then you cool it down. Use all sorts of cooling techniques from atomic physics, and uh, cool it down from you know, 1,000 Kelvin to nano Kelvin temperature. So then it becomes so cold, essentially uh, the thermal motion becomes negligible, and the interaction between those atoms become important. Right? So then your system becomes a very good analog simulator for uh, for that interacting bosonic or fermionic, depending on what your system is. And on top of that, you can add optical potentials. And those optical potentials uh, give you some control of changing the Hamiltonian. So for example, if you uh, put a deep optical lattice in this system, then you can control the, uh, the kinetic energy, the hopping between one side to the other side. So that gives you control of different uh, parameters in your Hamiltonian space. Another example is the Rydberg interactions, where recently there was a 51 atom demonstration of a 51 atom quantum simulator in, at Harvard, Michel Lukens group. Essentially, it's a simulator where you know, they have neutral atoms and they could excite some atoms into a Rydberg state. A Rydberg state is essentially an atom with a loosely bound electron in between just a proper neutral atom. It's still a neutral atom, but it's a neutral alkali atom and an ion in between. So it's a loosely bound electron. And because the electron is so loosely bound, that means it, it has a very strong interaction with another Rydberg atom. Right? So, so simulation like that has been achieved. But here, let me talk about the uh, trapped ion system in more detail. Okay. So this is, an, this is a picture, like a real picture, of a bunch of trapped ions in a chain. Okay, so what you see here, it's a single, single atomic ion. Right? And we can image that for a couple of reasons. A, they are really, really cold, so the thermal motion is pretty much you know, stopped, non-existent. The separation between the ions, because they are charged, they repel each other. So the separation is about a, a few microns, a micron to a few micron. And we have very good imaging system. So we can really collect the light from each individual atom. And you see like a nice uh, kind of a crystalline. It's, it's not a real crystal, of course. It's a small system, but a nice chain of ions. Uh, if you probe the electronic properties of this ion, then you see that Inside this ion, there are um, qubit states. These are different energy states. There are many of them. In fact, you can choose two of them and call them your zero and one, or call them your spin down and spin up if you want to study spin physics. Depending on what states you choose your qubit states um, as, you will have different advantages. So for example, here, uh, if I choose two hyperfine states that have zero magnetic quantum number, then I can possibly do an experiment using that atom in this room where there, there may be a large magnetic field noise next door uh, because this is a high magnetic field facility. The point is, these because those states have zero magnetic quantum number, the, the states don't change appreciably with magnetic field noise. 
So you can have a very long coherence time. And in fact, the record right now is about 10 minutes of quantum coherence on these atoms. Right? So literally, you can put an atom in a superposition, go out, you know, have your coffee come back, and the atom is still in a quantum superposition of up and down. So that's quite impressive. Uh, so now that we have identified our spin states or qubit states, now the goal is to simulate Hamiltonians or uh, make interesting entangled states and then characterize them. So the question is, how do we do that? Virtual? Yes. A single ion. So a chain is much less? So um, it depends. If we are not talking about some, um, an interacting system, if you are talking about really like individual ions, so essentially there is no interaction between the ions, then you can achieve maybe not 10 minutes, but of the order of minutes in a chain too. Right? Uh, however, if we are talking about coherence in an interacting model, that can become complicated. I will come to this here. Yeah. OK. So before moving on uh, to show you how we actually simulate the, um, the Hamiltonians here, let me try to motivate what's so special about atomic <laughs> systems. Right? So one really uh, nice thing, almost nature's gift to us, is that because the qubits are based on atoms, all qubits are pretty much identical, as long as we can control the magnetic field or electric field reasonably well in, an, uh, in the laboratory. Right? So take an ytterbium ion from here, take an ytterbium ion from there, they're identical. Which sounds trivial, but it's not, because there are qubits made of, let's say, a quantum dot, right? something that's a, a synthetic qubit or a superconducting qubit. Uh, so what happens there is, the qubit structure, the, the qubit splitting itself, is dependent on the material property of it, the, what's surrounding you know, mechanical stress and how you wire up and things like that. Here, we don't have to worry about that. So all the qubits are identical, which is a huge help. Uh, these atoms are usually well levitated, uh, sorry, well um, isolated from the environment because they are in a nice vacuum chamber where the vacuum is better than the outer space vacuum and it's shielded from radiation and all. And that's why we can have really long coherence time here. Uh, further, we have access to all the laser cooling techniques that have been developed by, uh, by many you know, pioneering atomic physicists in the last few decades. So for example, with a trapped ion, we can cool a trapped ion from 1,000 C to millikelvin in only a few milliseconds. Right? So you just turn on the light, and a few milliseconds later, done. The atom is um, at the pretty much at the ground state of its quantum mechanical motion. Okay. Uh, the interactions in, for example, the trapped ion systems are engineered. Um, I'll show you in a minute. And so because they're engineered, we can tune the interactions. We can turn them on and off. We can change the range of the interaction, the nature of the interactions. Uh, another two important points here is the, both the time scale and the space scale, like how far they are they are quite favorable to doing experiments using conventional optics and electronics. And I showed you a picture of, like right here, a bunch of ions in a chain. And because the spacing is not angstrom, but the spacing is micron, so doing just normal optical microscopy, we can look at these systems. And these are individual qubits or spins. So we can take a snapshot. Let's say we, you know, we are making an antiferromagnetic state, so we'll take a snapshot. And you can say, OK, this one is spin up, this one is down, this one is up, this one is down, this one is up. So this, such a thing is possible there. And at the same time, the, the dynamical time scales, the energy scales, are roughly kilohertz to megahertz, which means there are normal electronics that you know, still can be done by a first year gr graduate student in the lab uh, is enough to look at the time dynamics here. You know, do not need to go to uh, crazy high frequency. Okay. Now, we mentioned that we uh, will use different laser, laser optics techniques. And in fact, uh, different optical techniques are so helpful. I'll give you only a couple examples. Let's say you try to uh, take a sample of atoms uh, in, in, a, in a solid uh, and then ask, OK, can I polarize these atoms? Can I flip all the spins along a particular direction? 
Uh, again, the answer is yes. You just go to the high magnetic field facility and turn on a huge magnet, and then that will polarize the sample. We don't need to do that either, because these are individual atoms where we know the, uh, the energy states. So we can choose our laser frequencies in such that they, in uh, a few microseconds, we can polarize the sample with almost 100% efficiency. Right? Uh, and to show you how, just a quick animation, let's say, so this was my spin up, and this was my spin down. If the particle started with spin up, I turn on a laser which excites to these states, and then it decays spontaneously to the spin down state. Now there is no light that can take it out of the spin down state because there is a hyperfine, hyperfine splitting between the spin down and the spin up. So it will basically get stuck there. Right? So this is also a very interesting example where we are uh, creating a quantum mechanically pure single particle state out of a decoherence mechanism, which is essentially spontaneous emission. Well, we like to think spontaneous emission as decoherence. Not always. Here it's a pure state right there. Okay. What about measurement? So we can spatially resolve the ions, but it would be great if we can say, okay, if this is spin up or spin down. And indeed, we can do that. So for that, what we do, we again turn on a laser beam. I just change my frequency in an experiment, and I turn on uh, the frequency between up and zero. All right. So what happens? It goes up and comes down. So it goes up here, and it spontaneously decays. Now the trick here is this state is decoupled from this state because of the dipole moment forbidden transitions. Right? If you recall your basic atomic physics here. So if I am spin up, this thing never comes to spin down. So that means I can repeat the process many, many times. I can keep the light on. It will go up and scatter. And I'm sitting there with a photomultiplied tube or with a camera and collect lots of photons and say, OK, my atom is fluorescing. That means it has to be in spin up. On the other hand, if my atom started in spin down, then again, because of this hyperfine level, that laser is now doing, not doing anything because it's now detuned by that hyperfine transition, which is you know, 12 gigahertz, 12.6 gigahertz. So then I would not be seeing any photon coming out if I repeat the experiment many, many times. So by just looking at it, I know with 99% you know, efficiency whether my system is in up state or a down state. OK. So we have done initialization, detection. So now the main thing, how do we manipulate coherent, coherently both the spins and also induce the interaction between the spins? So, Let's say uh, we want to flip the spin of this ion. Well, that's easy. We bring in a, a radiation field, which could be just a microwave horn, uh, or it could be two laser beams where I have created a beat note frequency at the hyperfine frequency, which is the frequency difference between spin down and spin up. And that would do a Rabi flopping. So if I can just time it, correct, time it right, then it would go from spin down to spin up in a coherent way. And similarly, it can go from spin up to spin down also. Now, how do we uh, entangle, or how do you couple two spins, two qubit spins? And recall, the, there is a very little interaction between these spins because they have a finite uh, dipole moment. But that interaction is really, really tiny. So we are not worried about that. What, so essentially, these are free spins. And we want to engineer an interaction that I can just turn on and turn off on demand. So we need some common connection that connects these two spins. And that connection is the vibrational motor phonon. Because these are charged particles, ions. So if I shake one ion, the other, everybody will, will see that motion. So I can, uh, I can shake one ion and uh, populate some phonon motion, which the, another ion, which could be like on very, very far away physically from that ion, can see. Right? So essentially, we'll, make use of that. So for that, let's bring in another radiation field. But this time, I tune my frequency to be the hyperfine or the qubit frequency plus frequency of a vibrational phonon. Right? So essentially, this will flip only when there is a, a, a phonon created, because that's the resonant condition. So now if I bring in, uh, and, and, and we can write down the, uh, the Hamiltonian there is sigma plus, which is just the atomic, flipping the spin from down to up. And A is a, a creation operator of that phonon, A dagger. Okay. Now let's bring in a second radiation field, which is tuned such that it's qubit frequency minus the vibration frequency. Right? So if we do that, then 
only because this phonon is present in the system, it can flip the spin. If the phonon was not present in the system, then it will not flip the spin, right? So that means the phonon essentially coupled my two spins and effectively I went from uh, two spin down to two spin up. And I can do this process in a couple of different ways. We can, uh, we can keep this process on resonance. So this detuning delta that I have introduced, I can keep it to zero. So that means essentially the phonon is now a real phonon. I'm exciting it on resonance. And in that process, we can still do all of phonon simulation, but then I have to um, stop it, like do our whole experiment in a stroboscopic way such that the phonon does not become part of my Hamiltonian. So I will only stop the experiment or look at discrete time where the phonon comes back to its in initial position, et cetera. Uh, or I can simply detune my, uh, these laser frequencies far away from the motional mode such that the phonon is emitted only as a uh, kind of an off resonant slow perturbation sense. Then effectively I have an uh, interaction between, um, between our spins. I think. Please feel free to stop me if you have questions. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, are we really addressing individual ions here, or are we? Is this? Did you mean it in the sense that then you're sort of doing all to all? Or, or that's right. That's right. So, um, so this picture holds if you do individual, if you address individual ions as well. But experimentally, it's much easier if you just shine a big fat laser beam because this, you know, this length scale, even though I'm drawing it big, this is only a few tens of microns, right? So experimentally, it's much easier if I shine a big laser beam which carries all these frequencies. So this frequency and that frequency. Um, and then essentially, that will flip my all possible couplings. That will create all possible couplings. That is the easy thing to do experimentally, and that's what has been done mostly. However, if you have uh, access to individual ions, then you have much more control of shaping these interactions, J, I, J, essentially. Okay. So, so if I ask what is that J, I, J, or what is the strength between uh, interaction ion I and J, and there are a bunch of, you know, different things which I have not explained, but the, I think intuitively, one thing is, for sure, because the interaction is driven by my laser or the radiation field, the stronger I drive the system, the stronger the interaction would be, right? So that's the first term, which are the Rabi frequencies, how fast I'm flipping those atoms. So that is proportional to the power of the laser. Why is this dancing? That's power of the laser. Uh, and then there are some fundamental constants, like the momentum, like the, you know, Planck's constant mass, but also the momentum of the radiation field because it's that momentum that's kicking the atom and exciting the phonon motion. So that goes in there, that's the recoil frequency. And then this is a control knob, which is uh, the precise nature of the phonon that we are exciting, okay? So imagine I you know, play this game of crea you know, creating a spin excitation and a phonon excitation and then killing that phonon, but where my phonon is uh, just the center of mass phonon. So all the ions are moving together. And if I am using my center of mass phonon to couple interaction between two ions, then uh, intuitively you can see that there is no concept of who is nearest neighbor and who is next nearest neighbor. Because in the center of mass mode, everything is moving together, right? So that interaction, that you know, engineered interaction is essentially an infinite range interaction. Okay? And that interaction is off the moment I turn my laser off. And similarly, uh, so, that, so that last part is essentially the K denotes the mode, B I K denotes the eigenvector of that mode, the contribution of that eigenvector from all these different ions, and mu is the laser frequency, and omega K are the mode frequencies. So essentially those are the parameters that dictate what's the interaction between ions that I can control. And let me show some examples. So let's say I have about 10 ions and 10 different normal modes of vibration. Okay. The highest mode is the transverse center of mass mode where all the ions are moving together. If I tune my uh, laser frequency close to the center of mass mode, if I tune it really, really close to the center of mass mode, as I have argued, then the interaction should never fall. It should be an infinite range interaction. If I move slightly away from the center of mass mode, then uh, I will have effect from all the other modes and that would make the interaction 
range a little bit shorter range, not an infinite range. And in fact, by playing with this separation, uh, which is just by playing with the frequency in the laboratory, I can control the range of the interaction in this material, which is very hard to do in a real material. You have to make a new material for a different range of interaction. Okay. Similarly, if I go, let's say, in between my mode number two and three, and depending on you know, how these modes look, I will have interactions where uh, the, the you know, short range interactions are ferromagnetic and the long range interactions are strong and they are anti-ferromagnetic. So this is a spin system where the ground state in fact has domains because of the long range strong anti-ferromagnetic model. Right? And uh, I can go in between different modes and see different kind of interaction. So it is still, it is not completely arbitrary but I have I can choose a detuning such that the, you know, the interactions become interesting and it's a non-trivial uh, quantum spin model. And as I mentioned, if we uh, tune close to the center of mass mode, then effectively all the interactions are same range, uh, same sign, and they effectively follow a power law of interaction. By, and by just playing with uh, the frequency, I can tune the range of the interaction from an infinite range all the way to a dipole in a continuous manner, effective. Right. Okay. So, unless there are questions, right. let's move on to uh, some experiments that we can do with this system. Uh, probably the majority of experiments that have been performed with these trapped ion systems belong to adiabatic quantum simulation protocol. Although more recent in the last two, three years, that's changing. Now people are more focused on uh, looking at many body quantum dynamics, okay, because that's interesting too. So in an adiabatic quantum simulation, what happens is, let's say I want to simulate this Hamiltonian, which is a transverse Ising model. Uh, it's a long range transverse Ising model. Jig is the interaction between the X components of the spin and then sigma Y is the Y component of the spin, which is coupled to an external magnetic field. And this is a quantum Hamiltonian because these two parts don't commute with each other. So depending on the relative strength of the magnetic field to the coupling, we would have different uh, states, different ground states. So let's say I pick a magnetic field and Jij and ask what's the ground state, okay? How do we experimentally find it? So we do it using adiabatic quantum simulation protocol, which is, okay, let's stare at the Hamiltonian and see in some limit whether we know whether, uh, whether we know the ground state of the Hamiltonian in some limit. And that's easy. When the magnetic field is very large or the Jij's are zero, then effectively the ground state is all spins aligned with the magnetic field. And that's a state that's also easy for us to prepare because it doesn't require entanglement. Right? So I initialize all my spins and rotate them by this coherent microwave operation uh, along Y direction of the block sphere and then I turn on the Hamiltonian. So then I'm starting in the ground state of the Hamiltonian. And next I'll be slowly ramping the Hamiltonian down uh, and changing the parameters slow enough such that I, I, can, I am always in the ground state, instantaneous ground state. Uh, and then I stop at the value of B and J, I, J that I want to look at the system. Right? And then I do a detection. And we can detect in any basis because we can again rotate our basis by single qubit operations. Okay, so let me show you some, um, some results from a set of experiments that we did uh, around like a few years back in, uh, at Maryland. So here we have about 10 ions, we have okay, exactly 10 ions, and uh, the interaction falls off roughly as the distance between those ions. These are anti-ferromagnetic interactions. What we are experimentally measuring is the correlation between, let's say the first of that, first of first ion with all other ions. So to start with, I initialize my system in a magnetic field which is much larger than all the uh, interactions. So uh, this is average of the interactions. And then as you would expect, then the correlations are pretty much zero because I'm measuring along X and initially the spin is polarized along Y direction, okay? And now we start ramping the magnetic field down and slowly you start seeing the antiferromagnetic order popping up, right? So the correlation becomes negative with the second spin positive with the third, negative, positive, negative, positive. So this shows that my ground state is essentially um, antiferromagnetic. In fact, 
we have pictures, right? Because it's the picture that we look at and tell whether a spin is up and down. So we can go back and we can say, okay, what's the picture that we got most number of times? So we see that, okay, out of 2,600 repetitions of the experiment, we had about 222 events of this picture. So this is raw picture, no processing, okay, on the camera. And you see this, there, there is an iron here. It's uh, dark, so that means it's been down. So about 222 events, we got an up, down, up, down, up, down. And 219 events, almost equal, we got down, up, down, up, down, up. So it's also a beautiful uh, um, result because it's a, uh, it shows that because the system is so small, it does, there is no, nothing called a spontaneous violation of symmetry or something. The system is small and we get both, uh, the, the, both of these nail states roughly in very equal propor proportion. In fact, not only we can look at the most probable, uh, yes please. So, that was 2600 runs? Yeah. What happened in the other one? That's right, right here, yeah. So, uh, in fact, we can look at, because you know, we have all the pictures, so if we have a way of uh, uh, like ranking all these two to the 10, which is 10, 24 spin states, then we can look at the probability. So on the top, what I'm showing you is the probability when uh, there's a large magnetic field. So essentially it's a depolarized system. And you see basically all of them are zero. There are some higher that, you know, that can come from some small detection errors or things like that. But then you see at the end of the simulation where the magnetic field was ramped to pretty much zero, much smaller, you see these tall peaks, and those are my nail states, up, up, and down, down. And on top of that, you have some other <coughs> relatively tall peaks, right? So the question is why, as you asked, what happened to the other cases, okay? So the other, uh, population, you know, some, some, you know, 80% of the time or 60% of the time, the population is, uh, are in those states. However, recall, these are only two microscopic population out of a thousand states, right? So it cannot be just by coincidence, cannot be by, you know, a random chance. There is a population here. And in fact, if you increase the quantum simulation, uh, the system size, so the next experiment we did was with uh, 16 ions. And there the population of these up, down, up, down, and down, up, down of states went down to only about a few percent each. But still, if you look at the distribution, those are very clearly, uh, you know, very clear peaks. Okay, so what's going on with the other? In fact, we looked at some of those. And this is what they look like. So the, uh, the, 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 the tall peaks over there, you have up, down, up, down, and then down, up, down, up, down, up. So there is a domain formed right there. Um, and similarly, you have you know, all possible, because of left-right symmetry and up-down symmetry, you have all four states. They're roughly equal in probability, roughly 2% each. And then if you look at some of the other states, which occurred with about 1% each probability, then you have up, down, down, up, then there is a domain, but on an outer end, basically, of the chain, right? Uh, so the location of the domain is um, partly because the energy difference between these two cases is partly because the coupling Gij is not fully uniform along the chain. There's a, there's a stronger nearest neighbor coupling near the center compared to the outside and so on and so forth. Okay. But the point is, experimentally, you can just take a look at these pictures and you can you know, get all this information about correlation functions in a very direct way. So a few examples, a few other experiments that I will not go into detail um, came from, came in, in the later years, from in, in the last three years. So this is a beautiful uh, set of experiments done both at uh, and Maryland in Chris Monroe's group, but also an, at uh, Reiner Blatt's group in Austria, Innsbruck, where they looked at the, um, basically violation of a Lieb-Robinson uh, Lieb kind of bound of correlation <laughs> propagation in a, uh, in a system. So essentially what they are doing is they, uh, pre it's an XY kind of Hamiltonian, so in a flip-flop Hamiltonian. You prepare the spins in let's say all down state, and in one of these experiments, they flipped the center spin up, and then looked at how quickly that correlation or that excitation propagated to outside the system away from the center. 
Uh, in the other experiment, they instead of flipping one spin up, they flipped all the spins together. So they created uh, like an excitation pretty much everywhere, and again looked at the correlation and how quickly the correlation propagates. And here the um, you know the sort of counterintuitive feature here is that because the interaction in this system is is long range interaction, the interactions were tuned near the center of mass more, so it was you know, relatively long range, and further they could tune the interaction range by playing with the frequency. Uh, the, the, the correlations do not propagate in a linear fashion, just like you'd expect in a system with only short range interactions, right? And that's because if, if, if the interaction is very short range, then in order for the correlation or for the disturbance to go from, you know, from this side to that side, it has to be mediated by everything in between because it's only affecting short range interactions. On the other hand, if there is a long range component to it, then the problem becomes much more complicated because there is a short range component and there is a direct interaction. So what we see is a many body interference of all these different paths that this quantum information can propagate from one side to the other end of the system. And effectively what that does is that bends uh, these light cone-like uh, propagation features. Right? And they could, um, they could measure that bending as a function of the range of the interaction, which is something that can be controlled in this experiment. Uh, another experiment people did was um, it's, it's looking into these many body localized phases. So essentially uh, made the interaction as short range as possible in this system. And on top of that, added a space, a spatially dependent magnetic field, which is random at all sides. Right? And that was driven into um, short signatures of a you know, finite system version of a many body localized phase. And more recently, this was a flashy result that came uh, in nature from Chris Monroe's group again, where they were, uh, instead of looking at the, at the ground state or looking at you know, some uniform dynamics, they were driving the system in a floquet Hamiltonian. And they found that because of uh, the many body dynamics what was going on was if the drive frequency was at omega, they were seeing a response at a subharmonic of that, which was interpreted as some kind of a, a, a correlated state and termed as a, a discrete time crystal. Okay. All right, so these are some of the experiments. I think I had a few slides, but because of change of computers, somehow that vanished. Okay. I have about, what, 15 minutes, 20 minutes? Okay, so just give me a second. Let me switch this quickly. Oh, sorry. Sorry for the problem, I, I didn't realize that I would not get an HDMI cable here. Yeah. Uh. Do you have an HDMI to VGA adapter? That's okay, I'll just copy the latest one.
Okay. Sorry about that. All right. So, so now in the remaining you know, uh, 15, 20 minutes, let me, uh, let me talk a little bit about some of the uh, some of the possibilities of these kind of experiments going into the future. So um, this is a technology that's still under development and really, really new. So this is really kind of an outlook section. Uh, if you look at the difference between different kind of quantum architecture for uh, building quantum processors, then uh, there are some differences. And here is a, a recent uh, experiment comparing a, an IBM superconducting structure and the trapped iron, both are five qubit system. And essentially what you see the difference is in the case of the trapped iron system, uh, it was easy for them to wire the system in a fully connected way. What I mean by that is you have you know, five qubits, one, two, three, four, five. For the IBM quantum computer, the five you know, qubit quantum computer, the connection came from the physical, you know, physical wires, physical connection between qubits. So once you have chosen to build your hardware, it's not so easy to go back and you know, turn on another connection. However, I hope it's clear from my description uh, that the connection between these trapped iron qubits come from these phonon mediated interactions, right? So the phonons are already there in the hardware. I do not have to go and make something. What I need to do is just externally control my laser fields, my classical fields, to just properly use that connection, that wire. So this gives the trapped iron system a, a, an interesting feature, and in some cases, an advantage. So uh, if you go to this paper, they have compared different quantum algorithms and how these two systems uh, work, how they compare. And it's not true that for all quantum algorithms you need, uh, you will see an advantage of a connected system versus a disconnected system versus a you know, not so connected system. Uh, but there were some examples, for example, this three qubit uh, Toffoli gate, it's a, a quantum logic gate, where they show that uh, the trapped ion system performed better about 85% of the time. The success rate for the Toffoli gate was 85% and 53% uh, was the superconducting qubit. And that speed up, uh, the conclusion of the paper was the speed up was coming from uh, this more connectivity between these trapped ion systems. It's not clear that this will be advantageous for any algorithm, again, but they have shown a few algorithms and, uh, okay. So motivated by that, let me ask a, uh, as, as a related question, which is, if we are thinking in terms of quantum simulation, that is not making a quantum computer explicitly, can we have control over all interactions between these spins, right? So I showed you different kinds of interactions depending on where I choose my you know, laser frequencies, but, though, but individual interactions between the pairs were not fully controllable. I choose my frequency and that gives me a certain profile of the interaction. Can I engineer a system where a theorist, you're all theorists, you can write down a matrix of JIJ matrix and whether I can go to my system, just dial in, and my system would give that interaction Hamiltonian, right? So it's hard, not been done, but we know in principle how to do this. And a lot of uh, experiments now are pushing towards that direction. So one straightforward extension to what we have already talked about in this uh, earlier is that instead of using one frequency for my external control field, let's bring in more frequencies. Let's bring in n control frequencies. So the experiment now becomes complicated. But as an advantage, what we are getting is a knob, is a control of how each ion, each ion spin talks to each of the n phonon modes. So then in principle, if I have control over the intensity as well as the frequency of my radiation fields, I have n roughly n square control, so n intensity for each frequency, right? And how many interactions I have in a system, two body interactions, I have n choose two, which is n square over two interactions. So in principle, I have more control than I have interactions, and then it becomes an optimization problem that is choosing a set of controls, where by control, again, I mean the coupling between individual spins and these different phonon modes, 
such that the interaction mediated by different phonon modes, they interfere in such a way to give us the desired Hamiltonian. Okay? That is, I would say, the analog extension of what we have done. And uh, uh, that is known as the momer sorensen technique I should have mentioned before, this way of uh, creating the interaction. So this is a cartoon way of it. I have these, you know, again, the N phonon modes. I bring in different lasers with different intensities. And they are not only, you know, different intensity globally, but locally also different. They're shining on different iron with different uh, intensity. And then I can do. And if we have access to that kind of interaction control, again, you know, no experiment has shown this, but if we have control over uh, any pair of interactions, then I can create a reconfigurable crystal lattice, right? By just renaming what I call ion one, two, three, four. So from a chain of 25, a linear chain, I can in principle create a, a, 20, a five by five 2D configuration and study some 2D physics in it from the same physical system. So this is a simulation from, uh, from this paper from 2012. So essentially what's doing is this is my target interaction profile and what it's solving is my, uh, what frequencies I need and what intensity I need at each ion. So it's the coupling between individual ion and individual phonons is that 2D coupling matrix. And one thing you notice, which is a, a, a good, good news for experimentalists, is this matrix is quite sparse. What that means is that we don't really need, like all, we don't need to think about all possible phonon modes and uh, for you know, most realistic experiments. Especially if we can tolerate a little bit of error, then we can simplify this and it can possibly be implemented in the system. Or this is an example from 36, it's a, what, it's a Kagome lattice, right? And again, uh, this is the interaction. Uh, this is the required you know, technical infrastructure. Okay. Now, if we want to simulate something like a 2D square lattice, which has a kind of a symmetry here uh, in terms of interaction, there is another possible way of doing that, which is somewhere in between a fully analog quantum simulator and a fully digital quantum simulator, right? So I call it a hybrid quantum simulator. So the idea is, we will uh, have a Hamiltonian H, which is created by this analog quantum simulator method that has the right interaction strength between the ions. So let's say I want interaction between one, two, and one, four equal. So I will choose my uh, momer sorensen detuning, my laser frequency such that I find a configuration at which those interactions are roughly equal. And then on top of that, I will superimpose some single qubit phase correction, and I will do it in a digital way. I'll turn it on and off, right? And so essentially what, what this, you know, if you, if you like, it's a grating in time domain. What it does essentially is it uh, cancels or destructively interferes all the interactions that I do not want. For example, interaction between one and five, two and six, five and nine, four and eight. It will just destructively cancel, just like if you, send some light through a grating, then it cancels intensity at certain places and constructively interferes. And similarly, it will uh, not destructively interfere or constructively interfere at between one, two, and two, three, and three, six, and two, five, and so on and so forth. So this is not a full solution. This cannot be used for any arbitrary lattice geometry, but this is an intermediate solution which works for many of the problems that would be of interest and it's experimentally easier because it does not require all those frequency controls. What it requires is a global uh, beam to engineer the interaction and a local, like a phase gradient, which can be done by turning on a laser beam and using just a stark shift gradient, right? Just the intensity gradient. Uh, it's not going to the mathematics, but essentially what it's doing is in that flip-flop Hamiltonian, that phase gradient is adding uh, a phase control, like e to the minus i omega ij is the gradient between the two spins and that behaves like a grating. Okay. So a uh, couple of pictures. Um, how to do that? How do we engineer a system where we are shining different ions and they are only a micron apart from each other very precisely with different intensity, right? So there are a couple of techniques and this technique was used in, uh, in that five qubit quantum computer paper from Chris Monroe's group. So essentially what it is, it's a, it's a device called multi-channel acoustopping modulator. You send in uh, a beam splitter, you send in you know, N different laser beams and it shifts the frequency of N different laser beams and you can control that. So essentially it creates a grid of N intensity, N laser beams 
and then you focus them onto your ion chain. That's one way. Another direction that, uh, uh, that I am pushing in my research group at IQC is instead of sending in separate laser beams, let's send in a big fat laser beam and we control the intensity of that laser beam in a holographic way. Just like if you have a hologram, then you can engineer an arbitrary interaction profile, interaction, uh, sorry, intensity, also electric field profile. So that, that is something that we are trying to uh, achieve. It, it's hard to do with ultraviolet, but that's a research in progress. Okay, this is my last slide, which is, so far I have talked about only spin half systems. However, if you look at my uh, iron, I had those other states, right? So these were my two spin half systems. I had the two other states. So in principle, I can also simulate beyond spin half, like right? so four state system. In particular, a three state system have been simulated in this 2015 paper. And uh, the Hamiltonian that they, that they uh, could simulate using this three spin system looks very similar to a Hamiltonian we saw uh, in uh, Duncan's talk this morning, which is a flip-flop Hamiltonian, and then there is an SZ term and then an SZ squared term. Okay. And this SZ term, it has a dependence on the, of the phonon mode, but these experiments can be done where the average occupancy of the phonon is very close to zero. So this is, this is basically just one, uh, AM dagger AM. So this becomes a, a spin simulation of a spin one Hamiltonian, with a flip-flop interaction and an effective field. Uh, which should give rise to some of the topological states. Now, the reason why this experiment could not progress very well was not because they couldn't, you know, they could simulate this very well, but the measurement was hard because now it's not a binary measurement anymore. You need to know whether it's in zero, plus, or minus, right? So you need two sequence of measurements, right? So my simple sequence would not work. And one way to do that is, um, known as a tech atomic physics technique, a shelving, right? So the idea is, let's say I prepare some state and before measurement, I will take this green, that state out and shelve it somewhere else, which is just in a bank vault. And now I can do a binary measurement and I know whether my state is in zero or minus, just like the binary qubit measurement I talked about. And when I'm done, okay, now let's bring that back from the bank onto this state. Now that bank is of course another metastable state that I can transfer the population and bring the population back from. And then I can do another binary measurement. So now I have two binary measurements. And from those two measurements, I know if it's a three level system. And similarly, you can think of uh, sim simulating higher spin systems, three half systems and bigger, bigger. Okay, uh, now I, I want to show you just one slide which was not there in the old, sorry. <coughs> so, so far we have only talked about uh, you know, two level system spin half, but this is a real atom and I want to show, not to scare you, but basically to convince you that you know, our atomic physics techniques we can use to reduce this complicated spectroscopic structure into just a two level system. I think that's quite beautiful, right? So this is an interbium ion, which is the ion that you know, many people work, work with. And these are in the ground state, you know, Hilbert, uh, in the ground state, ground hyperfine state, we have the two qubit states. Or for spin one system, these are the three spin one systems. But then there are all these other states, D states, F states, and there are some states that, uh, that's unknown even in the atomic physics community called bracket states. It's a very weird kind of coupling, which is not an LS or JJ coupling normally found in uh, angular momentum algebra. And uh, so we do have, in order to run these experiments, we, de we do need to have a bunch of lasers, essentially that can bring our system back to what we want, where we want, uh, if it goes to one of those states. Uh, but the point is, once you know those spectroscopic lines and we know how to handle, then this whole thing can be approximated a very good coherent two-level system, which remains coherent for about 10 minutes, right? So, um, okay, so with that, let me thank you. I'll pose the last question, which is a bunch of questions, but thank you very much. Questions?
Yes, yes. So that's a very good question. So the question is why didn't the you know, two antiferromagnetic states go to 50% you know, each, right? Why is it only 20%? So the majority of the uh, error came from uh, non-adiabatic or diabetic excitations because we are not doing this adiabatic phase transition properly, right, adiabatic quantity. Uh, and this is a problem of adiabatic quantum simulation in general, and it depends on the interaction. So that interaction was a long-range antiferromagnetic interaction, right, so it, it's a classically frustrated system. So if you look at the, the many-body energy gap, which is the smallest gap between the ground state and an excited state, and I'm you know, sweeping my system through the many-body energy gap, that gap is very small because it's very easy to create an excitation because of you know, long-range antiferromagnetic interaction. We also repeated the same experiment, but with all ferromagnetic interaction. Now that is much better, because if it's all ferromagnet, creating an excitation is very hard in the Ising setup, right? So, and this is a problem with adiabatic quantum simulation, and when you go to larger systems, essentially you have to increase the coherence time, because only then you can reduce the experimental speed and then go to the ground state properly. Did you simulate fermions? Yeah, so uh, not in an analog way because, uh, because again, we don't have fermions here, right? But what can be simulated is a spinless fermion in a digital way by uh, this Sorry, what's the transformation? Jordan Wigner transformation, right? The nonlinear transformation. Uh, in some case, I don't think it has been done, but it can be done. Interesting way. If you have more than two level system, higher level system, then you can possibly simulate other complicated fermion, like bringing the spin degree of freedom there. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, with the specific configuration, but also in the, what's the phase corresponding to that. So for example, now what you've done is that you, you rotated to sigma V or sigma X phases, but actually um, there's some sigma Y component, so you're actually measuring something like a one plus I or something, but uh, uh, because you are projecting to the sigma V phases, you can have some half, so the phase information is completely lost. Yeah. So do you, do you have any diffusion uh, like why to extract that I out of Yes, yes. So one way to do that, would be, and people do that um, in these experiments, is to uh, bring an I in your measurement basis, right? So let's say I'm running this experiment a thousand times, yeah. and hundred times I'm doing this measurement in Z basis, okay. and as you said, I will get an up and down. I don't know what's going on, but I can repeat this experiment where just before my measurement, I do a blind pi by two pulse, which is I am uh, orienting my measurement axis in the equatorial plane of the block sphere. And not only that, I can run a measurement where I am changing also the phase, like where I am looking into the block sphere, I'm looking along x or along y. And I think I will give an example in my next talk. This is a very powerful method of detecting entangled states. So for example, if you have a Schrodinger's cat state, then this is how you detect, by going to another basis and just rotating your basis, you see how the, how the state or some you know, quantity behaves, responds. And that's a, a quantitative way to detect the Schrodinger's cat.